Alexander McQueen was the rebel king of British fashion, a designer who reinvented the catwalk and created clothes that silenced his audience. Brilliant, offensive, beautiful, outrageous. He was making such a statement. He was pushing everything to the edge, and people were either going to love them or hate them. He was the son of an East End taxi driver who took over one of the grandest fashion houses in the world. An anarchist whose astonishing rise was made possible by an even more outrageous companion. He's a wild bird, and I think he makes clothes fly. They were just two kindred spirits. They were just as common and vulgar as each other. What neither of them could have guessed was the cost of that journey. At the very moment it seemed he had everything, it ended. In the suicide first of the woman who had discovered him, and then of McQueen himself. It's like Icarus, you know, when you fly that close to the sun, it'll burn your wings and melt the wax. This is a fable of fashion. A world that discards its past in an instant and drives its creators relentlessly in search of the next best thing. There's always an energy in London. The poverty, the unemployment, the drug-induced environment, the nightlife. Yeah, this brings back memories, babe. Walking back down here, that time. Down there was where that dive bar was, which was the Venus, was it? The dive bar. And I used to walk up here in those bumpsters and all the bloody... All the queens would be like, oh, look at that. What is he wearing? I met Lee in Soho. I don't know whether I was drunk when I met him, before I met him, but I was by the end of the night very drunk, yeah. We were skin. Everyone had known, you know, you go out on a tenner and drink, like, pints of cider with blooming... Well, snake bite, yeah, we used to yeah. call him. I went round to my parents for baked beans and tins of soup and things like that. <laughs> you slept all day and then you were always out at night yeah. and the people then you live your life around are prostitutes and all sorts of sort of exciting low life in a way. It was just after all that acid house that everyone was going to nightclubs where you just dressed up. We used to take inspiration from designers like Galliano or Westwood. We'd make our own versions out of plastic bags, just crap that we found on the streets. Like PVC, it was all a bit fetish, it was all a bit like feather boas, butterfly wings. I sort of was a bit androgynous, I sort of did punky drag. I used to think I was anyway. <laughs> I'd say thought Donatella Versace goes skateboarding. <laughs> Lee McQueen's nightlife of acid house drag and knockoff couture was a world away from his first day job. He was a tailor on Mayfair's Savile Row. He'd started there at 16, an apprentice drilled in the craft of tailoring exquisitely cut suits for the aristocracy. He started in the mid 80s here, about 86. He was in our it would have been scruffy, but, I mean, it's classed as casual, isn't it? I mean, that's how people dress. But then, of course, um, as everybody's heard, I mean, he, he, he said he did drawings in Prince Charles's clothes. I'm in Savile Row, at the top of this old building, like, with a load of old tailors, and it's really boring. It just happens to be Prince Charles's jacket I was working on at the time. <laughs> and so I, I draw this big willy on it. <laughs> you know, with, like, oh, like no. you do. This part of the jacket, inside here, is a canvas. So he said he, he drew obscene things on the canvas. So we got the jacket back, but when we looked inside, there was nothing there. But uh, he mentioned it several times, but it wasn't true. So he was a bit of a rebel, wasn't he, really? I knew I, I couldn't survive in a place like that for the rest of my life, cluttered in a small workshop, sitting on a bench, padding lapels. But I did have a passion and I was good at it. I was good at tailoring a jacket. I was quick at learning and quick at learning trousers. I wanted to learn everything, everything. Give me everything. There was one place in London that had produced almost every designer of note in Britain, from Galliano to Paul Smith. It was the competitive hothouse called St. Martin's College of Fashion. McQueen had left school at 16 
He'd assumed he'd never get through the door as a student, so he went looking for work instead. He was hovering outside my office, this rather unprepossessing lad, and I said to him, who are you and what, what, what do you want? He said he wanted a job, and I knew that was out of the question because he was about the same age as the students, and they would never have taken him seriously. But I became more intrigued by him. You know, you sense something in someone. McQueen came back a second time with samples of his tailoring and drawing. He was offered a place the same day. The apprentice tailor was now an MA student of fashion. I did go and talk to the head at the time and said, I think he's brilliant, but he probably won't last. You know, he probably won't be able to take it because all the others had come, you know, through the right routes. As McQueen began his course, half a mile away in London, a fashion journalist was starting her annual search for new discoveries. Her name was Isabella Blow. When I was working at Vogue, I saw this person strutting madly around the office like a sort of chicken, you know, in these incredible clothes, like a sort of bird of paradise or something. If Izzy thought it was chic to wear a lobster on your head or surreal, that's what she was going to do. Isabella was an aristocrat and fashion anarchist. She was lawless and irreverent. She'd been sacked from Tatler and American Vogue. But she also had a true eye for talent. She discovered a student hat maker called Philip Tracy and used her contacts to launch him on the fashion circuit. Some people just have an eye for beauty that other people don't have. So they can see that something is beautiful before other people might be used to that particular look. In February 1992, St. Martin's held its MA graduation show, and the fashion journalist with the hawk eye was in the audience. I was sitting on the floor, I couldn't even get a seat at the St. Martin's show, and the pieces went past me, and they moved in a way I've never seen, and I wanted them. I just thought, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I just knew he had something really special, very modern. It was about sabotage and tradition, all the things that I suppose the 90s represent. Isabella decided she must have every piece in McQueen's collection. I rang between six and eight times a day. Finally, I got a little voice on the end of the line, hello. So I said, yes, son, can I come make an appointment with you? My name's Isabella Blow. I don't know to this day if he knew who I was. No, I just wanted the money. I was desperate for money. I said, that's 350, love, you can take it or leave it. He came and told me he'd sold the clothes. I mean, I thought it was great that Isabella was going to be really good news for him because she was going to introduce him to people, in fact, sort of carry on from where we'd left off. There's a little place over here where my brother, I don't know if you've ever seen, if he looks at my brother, a picture of it, he's got a chipped bone in his side here. And that little fence over there is where he slip, trod on and slips on it and whacked it. McQueen grew up in Stratford in East London, the youngest of six children. His father was a cab driver and his mother a teacher. That's the house we lived at number 11. The top, that would have been our bedroom there. There was three boys, we were all in one bedroom. And you can see the birds flying about up the top. And I think if you see a lot of uh, these shows and stuff like that, there's a lot of feathers and birds type of thing going on. So. Perhaps that's where Lee gets a lot, or got a lot of his ideas. Watching the birds of prey that nested on the estate and drawing the clothes and dresses they inspired was McQueen's childhood passion. He always wanted to be a designer. He always has. When he left school, he wasn't sure what to do. Quite a few of the family were involved in tailoring. So I just said to him, well, you know, why don't you go and try? It's 
So this is the North Hall, which is the entrance hall to Hills, which was built in 1913 by my architect grandfather. When I first met Izzy, I was fascinated by um, the way she looked. And on top of her head, she wore this hat. So it's, it's very easy. You see the feathers moving, a bit, bit of a veil to hide herself. A sense of theatricality and a vulnerability. Isabella Blow seemed to the world a woman of effortless wealth and privilege. She'd worked for Anna Wintour in New York. She'd partied with Andy Warhol. She flagrantly dropped the names of everyone she knew in society and fashion. Her father said something very nice. He said, Isabella's not everyone's cup of tea, but you two are a marriage made in heaven. In reality, Isabella's life was not all it appeared. Izzy's grandparents lived a very glamorous lifestyle. Izzy famously used to like to say that her grandmother had once been a cannibal accidentally, and in Papua New Guinea had asked the tribesmen what she was eating, and they said the neighbor. <laughs> that life ended in scandal. Isabella's grandfather was accused of murdering his second wife's lover, Lord Errol, in Kenya. Though acquitted, he'd become a social outcast. He took an overdose of morphine and killed himself. The family land and fortune was lost. The house Isabella would have inherited was rented out as a boarding school. Izzy was an intensely romantic person. The glamorous Georgian house had been lost to her. So Izzy grew up in a pretty grotty um, gardener's cottage. And Izzy felt very much a sense of injustice that, and that sort of haunted her throughout her life um, about her lack of money. And Izzy craved for glamour. In McQueen, Isabella had spotted glamour in the unlikeliest of places. To launch his career, he needed a studio, but the only one he could afford was in a derelict district back in the East End. I was brought up around here. This is where I come from. It just seems uh, honest, an honest place. You know where you stand. If someone's going to mug you, they tell you before they do it. <laughs> there are a lot of big, empty, rundown spaces with a lot of creative people who'd all moved into that space because it was cheap, or you could squat it. That was the local bricklayer's arm. McQueen set up a bed behind a curtain in the studio and gathered a small team. Funding was courtesy of social services. I survived on unemployment benefit, and I bought all my fabrics with my doll money. At 24, McQueen staged his first fashion shows. He booked the only venues he could afford, dragging his small fashion audience to backstreet warehouses and using models who were cheap but full of attitude. I was just beginning as a model and he was just beginning as a designer. Every time I went out on the catwalk, we would all be lined up and he would be like, come on, Jones, but just go for it, just go for it, and psyching me up. And I'm going, yes, OK, right, we're going, let's go, like that. And he would be like, ow, and you just suddenly go. What McQueen unleashed was shock and awe especially when the bumster made its entrance. Yeah, the bumsters, they go right around and like your arse, like a builder's bum, wasn't it? You used to say they were about elongating the body. Right. The other thing was he just wanted to get people's arse out. Yeah. It was kind of electric. Even if you didn't like it, you couldn't dismiss it. There was a rawness that I think was right for the time and it made everybody sit on the edge of their seats wondering what was going to happen next. His mum used to come backstage and make all the sandwiches for the models. All those people that used to go out on the second night would also come round and they'd be on the sewing machines or cutting out or doing print or whatever. It 
it was almost like this whole mixture of misfits in terms of everyone from St. Martin's and Soho and the East End and wherever else, somehow were gate crashing this world of high fashion. His real name is Lee. Everyone else calls him Lee, but I call him Alexander because I think of Alexander the Great. Isabella told McQueen his clothes would sell better if he used his middle name, Alexander. And then she started marketing him to the press. Isabella was probably the best thing that could have happened to him. Those early shows. Got column inches. The press were interested. There was something within him. He wasn't just another ex-student. With Isabella's contacts, McQueen's shoestring creations were becoming the talk of the town. We were outside Izzy Blow's mother's house, and there was a bit of pallet wrap and we just bunged a zip in the back, and then that then went down the runway, and then it's in vogue. And it's saying it's £700, available to order from Browns. All camera crews were at the front gate. Everything Izzy did just turned to gold, and the same with McQueen, and they just understood each other on a level that, that most people wouldn't get. You know, it, it, was a, it was an energy. It was like they were old soulmates. And to see them backstage and her going through the clothes, and yes, and yeah, the other fab. This is awesome. It's like, oh, there's Izzy. There's Lee. Izzy was um, from a different world to what we're used to. Wacky hats and wacky clothes and uh, very loud in your face. But she was a very nice girl. And uh, they used to go away a lot into a place where they'd fly hawks. Lovely. Alexander was chubby, he was smiling, he was beautiful. He brought a magic to our lives, huh? On weekends at their country house, Hills in Gloucestershire, Isabella introduced Alexander to her blue-blooded world and fed her protégé ideas and inspiration. If she invited him down to Hills for the weekend, she would make sure that there was a falcon for him to fly and that he'd be out there with his dogs and that it would take him to see some fabulous country house. Like she was always providing all of this stimulation for him. She could give X on that self-confidence that she'd known Warhol, she'd known Anna Winter, and Izzy would say, you're up with them. That's good to hear when you're starting off age 22, 23. I think for any designer to have a muse, to have someone that's actually spurring you on and saying, I love it, go on, go on, make it more extreme and do that. I, I think, you know, he really needed someone like that. So then I just, you know, did my usual thing. Putting the magic wand everywhere. Egged on by Isabella, Alexander McQueen was getting a reputation as a young designer who loved to shock the front row. But no one was quite prepared for the collection he sent down the catwalk in the spring of 1995. It was called Highland Rape. Highland Rape was a fairly extraordinary experience because it's the first time I felt, look, now looking back, that Lee really put himself into the show. There was models that had ripped dresses with their breasts hanging out. There was one model came down the catwalk and her sanitary towel string was hanging out. There seemed to be an element of violence in it, violence or anger. I'm not quite sure what it was, but certainly something deep from his soul. He talked in the past about how one of his sister was in a relationship that was violent. He didn't think there was things that you couldn't express on a runway show. Normally a fashion show is about someone on a pedestal lifted up and suddenly here we are with someone that's about two foot away from you that looks like they've been attacked or brutalised. And he's sort of saying, and what the fuck are you going to do about this? The response from the fashion press was ferocious. Obviously, the assumption was that the models had been subjected to some kind of rape, which was why McQueen had very, very bad press, and there were a lot of accusations of misogyny. Having said that, McQueen was very canny, and he knew he needed that kind of press. The whole thing is shock. It's not a thing that um, my wife would have worn. 
if, it, it, but it's, it's a shock value, and it's not really what, what he wanted to sell. I think he wanted to sell more ordinary things, but to get in there in the first place, you've got to be able to do something a little different. You've got to have a shock value. The controversy, if anything, encouraged McQueen. The fashion press claimed to be horrified and repelled, but they never missed a show, and he relished unsettling them. It was this image of a shackled woman. The press, as usual, saw the negative connotations of that image. Oh, there was all sorts of references to slavery and uh, the female body, and it was a whole range of things, none of them very positive. McQueen said that he was interested in the curious way it made her move, rather like a dog. But it has obvious connotations of slavery because it was worn by a black model. I think it's an example of McQueen's showmanship and also his disingenuousness. Fashion writers were starting to ask if, in fact, he was a better showman than designer. Alexander McQueen's reputation as the bad boy of British fashion was starting to sour. When he announced his 1996 winter collection would be held in a historic church in London's Spitalfields, the critics' knives were poised. It was a freezing cold night. He was standing outside the Ten Bells, you know, where Jack the Ripper picked up his victims, and you can't help but be aware of that. Add to that the fact that there was about two or three hundred people outside that couldn't get in, and these huge church doors. People are trying to shut them, and there's three hundred people pushing, trying to get in. haunting. It had taken all that anger that was in those early collections and somehow there was a real sadness and a beauty and a, a tragic quality to what you were seeing. I think it was even more beautiful because it was so unexpected. All those people said it was all just about shock and aggression and all those other things. It was suddenly saying, well, actually, no, I can do this. I can just make women look amazingly beautiful. The collection at Spitalfields was a turning point. McQueen won the 1996 British Designer of the Year. He drank champagne with the Princess of Wales and took tea with the Prime Minister. None of us realised what was happening to him, I don't think, as friends at the time. And then I remember he gave me that £2,000 jacket, which was on the cover of Vogue, and I cut it up with a pair of scissors because I didn't like it, it was too long. <laughs> and he came round and it was hanging out from under the sofa, and he's like, is that that fucking jacket? And I'm like, oh, I didn't like it because it was too long. And he went, that's just been on Vogue. It took me six months to make it. In three years, Alexander and Isabella had conquered London. McQueen was being hailed as the future of British fashion. Suddenly, this new wave of cool Britannia took over. It is rock and roll, it is full on, but it was all really pushing fashion to the boundaries, and it worked. I know that you're talking to everybody, just quickly in a phrase, what is Alexander McQueen? He's a wild bird with a good silhouette, and he always makes, his whole work is about being, is a bird. So birds have movements, they have freedom, they're wild, they're free. They don't have to be responsible to anyone other than to their great technical ability to fly. And I think he makes clothes fly. Thank you very much. Isabella was always ready with a quote about her discovery. In their early days, McQueen needed it. Now it seemed a source of tension. These designers think that you made me. And you know, no, it's, 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 not, it's never been no, about... No, they don't. They know that that... What do they do? Because you see, they use it all the time in the press. Does that, really, does that really annoy you, that they always put this little strap on, as discovered by Isabella Blow? Does it really piss you off? No, not at all, because uh, he has helped me a lot in that way, but not in a way that she's sort of like, 
You know, she does it because she loves my clothes, not because she loves me. Exactly. That's the point. Oh. Because I, I can't do stand her so. guts. <laughs> <laughs> there was more trouble to come. Isabella and McQueen's relationship was about to be tested to the limit. In recent years, a new wave of pop and movie star have discovered couture, and the French have returned to the British for help to bring haute couture into the 21st century. Big continental houses like Vuitton, Dior, Givenchy began hiring kind of rebellious talent, and if you like, co-opting them into the establishment. The president of Givenchy asked me who should he hire, and I said, Lee McQueen. After just eight notorious collections, the French fashion house Givenchy was offering McQueen the role of head designer. When he left to talk terms in Paris, Isabella went with him. Alexandre is incredibly tense and stressed, which is strange actually because in one way you would have thought he'd be terribly excited about it. Izzy has this thing she's done earlier on in her life. When there's a tense situation, she sometimes used to do this um, Isadora Duncan dance, a striptease dance, and try to relax this very tense train journey. And Alex Holmes going, she's doing my fucking head in, she's doing my fucking head in. That afternoon, as Alexander wrangled his deal with Givenchy executives and lawyers, Isabella left to rest in a flat she'd borrowed. Then they get a call from Izzy to say that she's locked herself out of the flat because they send her a locksmith. <laughs> it's very easy. <laughs> so, I'm not surprised. Alexander said, yeah, she's doing my fucking head in. <laughs> Givenchy was the couture house of the aristocratic tailor Hubert de Givenchy. His muse was Audrey Hepburn, and he created handmade clothes for the wealthiest women in the world in her image. Refined, discreet, immaculate. Eric Lanouille was a senior press officer at Givenchy when McQueen first arrived. He now works for one of the oldest cabarets in Paris. La maison Givenchy était une maison de haute couture très traditionnelle, très conservatrice. Et Alexander McQueen est arrivé dans cette maison avec tout le côté britannique, rock et bad boy qu'on qu peut imaginer. Donc ça, ça a forcément été un choc. This is the Bette Lynch dress. <laughs> and we also treated it bonding plastic over the top for raincoats. So you get the whole ensemble. When he arrived with his young British team, a French journalist asked McQueen what he thought of Hubert de Givenchy's talent. What talent, he said. A journalist called us all street urchins. So we were kind of insulted about it at the time, but looking back on it, we were. We were in bleached jeans and zip tops, and um, there was a really healthy disrespect, I think, for, for the, the house. <laughs> Parce qu'on était, on est quand même une maison très, avec un savoir-faire extraordinaire, mais très classique. Donc euh, on n'avait pas l'habitude de bouleverser les choses. Et là, on a fallu qu'on bouleverse toutes les choses, la manière de travailler. I'm intent on just chopping things up. Not chopping them up to destroy them, but chopping them up to alter them. And uh, it's like, uh, they're quite precise. And like, like, take the threads out and this, and I just keep the scissors and go, whack it off. And uh, they go like that, and I go, it's okay, it's only clothes. J'ai souvenir d'une fois où uh, on avait fait un manteau de vison uh, de plusieurs couleurs en dégradé. Et Alexander aimait pas du tout le manteau et il a pris ses. Tout le monde refusait de couper dans le manteau parce que c'était. On coupe pas dans un manteau que Alexander a pris ses ciseaux. Et pendant une demi-heure, il coupait dans tous les sens, il, était, il transpirait, et il coupait, il coupait, il mettait des épingles de partout. Et nous, on était tous médusés de le voir. Et d'un seul coup, il y a eu une pièce magique qui est sortie. I had an idea that 
he should have a muse and she'd live there and she'd be at home in her salon as they did in the 18th century you'd have tea with her she'd talk she'd run around in the clothes she'd you know a sort of warhol factory thing but life is it's very corporate now you can't do that but that's what i would have done i'd have just had a wild time it's quite a shock for izzy she comes back with nothing mm -hmm. and um she's utterly stunned huh? Very soon afterwards, she does this interview. She's drunk, so she's actually saying what she feels um, and not being political. And she says, you know, she, she feels that Alexander's used her ideas and she, and, and she should be paid for it. She's very, very, she feels very hurt for it. Huh? And Alexander says, Izzy and I are not about money. Huh? She was dismayed that he did not give her a sort of proper job at Givenchy. I think she often felt, I discover all these people, and then what am I really getting out of it? What is Alexander McQueen? He's a wild bird with a good silhouette. She wanted to be involved. You know, she was involved emotionally with him. She loved him. Huh? It's the 19th of January, 1997, and as they say in the trade, we're about to witness a fashion moment. At the tender age of 27, British designer of the year, Alexander McQueen, is about to show his first haute couture collection. In haute couture, the dresses cost £20,000, and only the richest women in the world will ever buy them. But the Paris shows are the centrepiece of the fashion year. The eyes of the world were on McQueen. We all were corseted to the nines and then I swear to God I almost thought I was going to have a heart attack because I was so nervous because I can't breathe. So I'm like hyperventilating going <gasps> and he's kind of hyperventilating and I had this huge pineapple on top of my head. It's like the Brits in Paris just taking over a huge French fashion house. There wasn't a lot of space. Things, people running around like crazy, and I remember him just like legging over to Eva Herzegova and cutting the laces on her corset and saying, you fuck. And, you know, dragging her so that she'd get her to exit on time. And uh, she was in tears by the time she was out there. Nobody, I don't think, had ever treated her that way. It wasn't good enough. It was okay, but it was too derivative, and the tailoring wasn't quite what it should have been. And I, you know, he's, he's learned a very salutary lesson, and I think it'll make him a much better designer. L'accueil de la presse française, au début, a été euh, presque violente, je dirais. Ils se sont attachés à l'image superficielle. Bad boy, en fait. Paris was McQueen's first moment of failure as a designer. And nothing was quite as expected. He'd been moved into a bohemian area and was living there with his entire British team didn't really know how other designers and big Parisian couture houses lived or whether they had their own apartments. Qui n'était pas vraiment connu que Givenchy a imaginé que du coup il pouvait euh, faire les choses euh, euh, à l'économie, je dirais. Euh, <rire> C'est-à-dire en payant un peu moins cher que John Galliano n'était payé, en lui louant un petit appartement. The uh, apartment to begin with was a little bit bare and uh, it had just been repainted and refurbished and I remember him wanting to take a, uh, he wanted to take a big pot of red paint and kind of splash it over the, across the whole apartment. When you went there, it was typically an apartment of uh, young English uh, rock with uh, <laughs> canettes of beer everywhere, bowls of chips, the cendriers, plein de mégots, de, uh, de pétards. first time in his life McQueen had money. He paid back cash his family had lent him to get started, but 
his new wealth also created tensions. So your head of design at Givenchy has that sort of part of fame uh, for you made your, your mum and your, your dad accept your gayness more or have they always been cool about it? No, they haven't always been cool about it. Uh, well, my father was, was a London taxi driver. He would come home at night and say, God, I nearly run over a bloody queer last night in Soho. Right. And then all of a sudden everything's on Godoy because I'm solvent. Sorry, I just can't buy that. You know, you couldn't buy it then. Why are you buying it now? I didn't know till late on. My sisters and mum obviously knew, but I never did. I never looked at um, my brother in that way. And uh, it wasn't until about 10, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, maybe a bit more, he phoned me up to tell me that. So I said, well, whatever, you know, there's not nothing you can do about it. Everyone loves him the same, so and that's his life. Where was Legends? Legends was off of Burlington Street. It was like the one that was downstairs. That's where Kinky Galinky originally started. An openly gay man running a Parisian couture house was hardly exceptional, but McQueen's old world in Soho was more of a problem. I remember being out and having a drink with him one night, and he was saying that they told him there was absolutely no way that he could be seen hanging out with prostitutes and all that. And I felt there was like a distance between us, you know what I mean? It was like, yeah, but he, and he could feel it coming. It was almost not like he was saying goodbye, but it was like, you knew, I knew that he was moving up to another level. The pressure to prove himself on the Paris stage was now intense. And with his second collection, McQueen did something ingenious. He reinvented the old Givenchy style in a way that flattered and seduced his critics. What I wanted to portray is a new way forward for Givenchy, a much younger clientele, make it more trendy. Back in England, Isabella was talking up his achievement. I think he's already done a lot with the house because Givenchy have had a lot of press. As Alexander says himself, it's like taking a dinosaur out of the scene. I think in one season he's done that. So I think in a year he will have done 20 times that. Isabella was also enjoying some success of her own. She'd just been appointed fashion director of the Sunday Times. She and McQueen were reconciled and posed together for Vanity Fair. Alexander said it wasn't altogether charming. He said, Uzi, I hear you've been resurrected. And she had. I've started to really like Paris, and I'm thinking of standing much more than I ever thought I would. It's kind of nice that I have a special office for myself where in London I have to, I, I use a huge studio and it's shared by others. Here I have my own office, um, I pick up the phone and, and I get what I want. Because <laughs> I want it, I want it, I want it. <laughs> so I ask for it. McQueen was doing 10 collections a year now commuting between shows in Paris for Givenchy and those for his own line in London. Slowly he grew, he adapted, he went from being quite aggressive to really beautiful, softer images, silhouettes. I think he really adapted with that French influence. Chaque fois, on se disait, mon Dieu, mais comment ça va, qu'est-ce qui va se passer, euh, quel va être le défilé On savait qu'il y avait des... Vu ce qu'on faisait, on savait que ça allait être complètement différent. Pour lui, formidable de travailler avec des gens qui avaient toute cette technicité et qui sont capables de, de réaliser vos envies, vos idées les plus folles. C'était comme un laboratoire de travail, quelque part. They always put on a car for the mum sisters and they go to Paris a lot and they'd, he'd put them up for a night or two. They wouldn't have to do anything, you know, the car pick them up and come out to Paris and watch his shows. So that, that was, she was getting treated like a lady, like, you know, all the top stuff. But that's what mums want, isn't it? You know, that's, that's good. 
Mais vous savez, le rôle d'attaché de presse est aussi un rôle de, de nounou, comme on dit. Et il l'appelait pour lui demander euh, euh, de lui avoir euh, euh, certaines substances euh, vitaminiques euh, pour, tenir, euh, pour tenir toute la nuit euh, et le lendemain en période de défilé. Cocaïne, tout simplement. Oui, non, je ne parle pas de vitamine C, hein, je parle de cocaïne. I worked on 27 shows, and it was in a five-year period, and it was constant, 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 designing and developing, and uh, never really stopped. It was, a, it was a whirlwind. I felt that he had such an enormous weight on his shoulders, and he knew he had to sort of maintain the standard. Every show he had to surpass what he'd already done the season before. Alexander was someone de d'extrêmement sensible et je pense que son personnage de bad boy il le, il le construisait c'était une carapace et enfin et oui, il lui arrivait de forcément de, de, de craquer de pleurer euh, parce que comme je disais c'était quelqu'un de, de très sensible why should i fucking do these shows when you get stupid shitty press saying you're gonna get fired from Givenchy when it's not true you know what i mean it's... And all the hard work I do, I do 10 collections a year, and it's hard work. So, you know, and it was just like, sub the lot of you, I do what I like. Vanity, greed, it's like a TV set. People want to be amused every second of the day. They want to switch onto another channel, so they want to look. They don't read, they just like to look at something fun. As fashion director of the Sunday Times, Isabella was commissioning and styling shoots with some of the biggest names in fashion. The weekly deadlines were relentless. Like with Alexander, Izzy's ego starts getting out of control. She becomes slightly more melodramatic, more demanding. Sunday Times start to look at her stories and saying, these clothes are unwearable, going really avant-garde, just going really out there. I want to give up the magazines, because they're too much pressure for me. I can't take it any longer. She started to say, Yeah, I'm Isabella Blair. I have to do things in a certain way. That must cost me a fortune. So that was a lot of pressure for Izzy. After four years in the job, Isabella's public profile was higher than ever. Then one day, a courier turned up with a letter. She'd been fired. Izzy, to be fair, was an anarchist. And she was like, fuck you, fire me and fuck off. And then we discovered that it's been leaked on the internet. Isabella Blair, a figure from the past. She felt a sense of resentment and sadness and anger. Izzy can bounce back, but we're on a downward spiral ever after that, and we're always playing catch-up. Izzy cannot reinvent herself. By 2000, McQueen had produced close to 30 collections in three years. That September, he staged a show in London. He seated the fashion press around a mirrored glass box. For two hours, they were forced to stare at their own reflection while they waited for it to start. We were all sitting there looking at ourselves, and nobody, especially at the end of the day, after weeks of fashion shows, wants to look at themselves. Everyone was already discomforted. When the lights finally came on, the audience could see in, but the models couldn't see out. appeared to be really crazy in a kind of Victorian madhouse way. They came out, they were pitiful. Like the shows of his early career, it was the way McQueen portrayed women that unsettled his audience. Son image de la femme était très euh, inaccessible, violente, à la limite sadomasochiste quelque part. C'est pas une femme qu'on rencontre tous les jours dans la rue. When it opened up at the end, and you saw this woman there, and you saw the moth flying round, it really was incredibly distressing, disturbing, a feeling that there was something inside his head and his mind that you didn't want to know about.
Not for the first time, McQueen left people wondering if his models were being decorated or violated. The shows were becoming a form of performance art, but their purpose was still to sell clothes, and that was something causing tension with Givenchy in Paris. Il a jamais fait des vêtements facilement portables, et on était certainement la maison à cette époque-là qui avait le plus de parution presse, mais on ne vendait pas. Queen gave an interview to the press daring Givenchy to fire him. They'd moved him from the flat he shared with his British team into his own elegant apartment. But increasingly, he spent his nights in one of Paris's most luxurious hotels. By that stage, he'd realized that, you know, he was a very important designer and he should be having the very best. But the more they gave him, the less he enjoyed it, I think. We had to order, like, caviar. We had to order the most expensive things, but then we wouldn't eat it. It was... Sort of gratuitous, and I think that it's, it's it spoiled him. The revenge McQueen finally exacted was sudden and unexpected. C'est en décembre 2000 aussi que McQueen cède 51% des parts de sa société au Gucci Group. I really thought about every season whose collections do I look at and whose collections am I jealous of in a sense and whose collections do I think are absolutely amazing the guy who who ran Gucci Group he had like a billion or two billion euros to buy companies and he bought Stella McCartney, Bottega Veneta, Balenciaga you know they bought a lot of businesses it was a famous moment and Tom Ford was choosing which companies to buy and McQueen was the preeminently creative guy McQueen had signed a deal with Givenchy's arch rivals. The Gucci group promised him creative freedom so long as he made clothes that sold. He wants to be successful, so he understands that, you know, you can express whatever you want on the runway, but you have to have something beautiful on the hanger to sell to a store. Givenchy appointed another of Isabella's protégés as McQueen's successor. Clothes are clothes at the end of the day. They're meant to be worn. And, you know, nobody wants to look like an 18th century, you know, tablecloth. And nobody wants to wear money around their head. People want clothes. Yet another of her discoveries was moving on without her. He is not a tailor. He's a knitwear designer. Like, you know those puddings you have with um, sugar? The spun sugar. It's like that. He's a sort of fairy tale, kind of Welsh fantasy knitwear designer. But he isn't a technician of the silhouette. Isabella's own career as a fashion journalist had just been resurrected again. She was working back at Tatler, a magazine she'd been sacked from once already. God, it's stressful. You're here one day, you're gone the next, you bump into people, you know what I mean? You're all, but it's a very tiny little world. Isabella was also under pressure financially, though she always managed to look the part. I knew John when he was selling his clothes for $10 in baskets. And I just asked if I could have this coat, this Dior one. And they said, you looked after us and we were poor, so what's a coat to us? Isn't that sweet of them? And it means so much to me. So I've got this coat today. Is his costumes start to become more extreme? Huh? She starts to use her clothes as armor. She worried more and more about what was going to happen to her and she couldn't see a good future for herself. She could only project a very negative future. Not long after joining Tatler, Isabella and her husband split up for a time. She was being treated for severe depression. It was McQueen who encouraged her to get treatment and helped pay her bills. 
There's a great feeling that I doubt my heart fails. I never doubted Alexander's love for his ear. McQueen had come home with a license from Gucci to do what he liked on the catwalk. His already elaborate shows became more ambitious than ever. They lasted 30 minutes and cost on average a quarter of a million. He was making such a statement at the time. He was pushing everything to the edge. He was going to places and pulling things out and people were either going to love them or hate them. It was the sheer theatricality of the shows that were brilliant. And so you came out on a high. And then, of course, the next year, or whenever you saw the clothes, and you realized they were just clothes, and it was a sort of a magic performance. As his new business venture with Gucci took shape, another transformation was underway. McQueen himself was changing. He was much thinner, and he looked much more sort of slick. You know, you might see him more often instead of just in the scruffy old jeans, like in a really nice suit from Huntsman. Oh, yeah, he brushed up. They brushed him up quite well, love. <laughs> <laughs> but he looked amazing. You know, I remember him coming back, and he did look amazing, like sharp suits, real well tailored clothes, you know, and he looked fantastic. At 34, McQueen was the undisputed king of fashion theatre. Gucci got in touch and uh, the rest is history. He was voted best international designer in America and in London he collected a CBE from the Queen as his mother looked on. Isabella's eye for talent had been vindicated on the world stage. Her own career was at its lowest ebb. In February 2007, she took a job in Kuwait shooting the lifestyles of the rich. It had been arranged as a comeback. There was something about Isabella that really reminds me of a great actress, you know, like your Joan Crawford's, like your Betty Davis, a real character. She had that sort of style. That was, you know, captivating. We started driving around Kuwait in the back of a Hummer in all this heat, and uh, she was sitting in the back of the car and with her Philip Tracy hat on and looking out onto the desert and just the vast expanse of, of sand just rolling on and, and lost, you know. She was half there and half in dream. Isabella's depression had grown steadily worse. In early 2006, she'd attempted suicide three times in three months. She'd wrecked a car, jumped from a bridge. She'd even tried to copy her grandfather's suicide by taking an overdose. We would spend nights in the villa, in the hotel, talking, um, you know, till dawn. And then that's how the tapes began. You know, you know that fake it to make it is the classic line. Did you fake it to make it? No, well, the thing is, I can't fake it now anymore, because no. everybody knows I've, I've fucked up. I mean, it's going to be very difficult to fake it when you're not doing anything. People say, how are you? Very well. What are you doing? Uh, not much. Oh, look at this little seagull. Look. Oh, darling. Look at the silhouette of this bird quickly. Now, that is the McQueen silhouette. You notice how all the skirts are like that? Yeah. McQueen. I mean, he's like a crocodile. He's very, very funny. McQueen wanted her to be well. He wanted her to be on again, and he wanted her to be back to being Isabella. At that point, you know, he wasn't answering her calls, and she said, you know, he won't see me like this. It was a sort of a tough love. 
she was trying, she was fighting with herself to get back on form and to prove that, you know, yes, I can do it, I can, I can shake this depression and get back to work. One afternoon, Isabella stayed back at the hotel. She took a massive cocktail of pills. It was her sixth suicide attempt in two years. From every side, the pressure on McQueen was rising. On the catwalk, he was king. But with Gucci, the ambition was a global brand. He was designing menswear, sunglasses, a jeans line. He had a perfume and signature trainers. The collections never stopped. You're constantly being judged. You're only as good as your last show, your last collection, your last review. And think, the bigger it gets, the harder it gets. I remember once I went to a show, he sat there and he asked me, and I said, to be honest, I didn't think it was one of your best. And he was so upset, he actually cried. And two of his PR people came over and chastised me, and they said, why did you tell him? And I said, look, I'm not going to lie to Lee, you know, I mean. I was shocked at how he could be so upset that he'd actually cry in public because a reviewer told him it wasn't one of his best shows. I had no real sense of what was to come. In April 2007, Isabella asked McQueen to come to Gloucestershire for a weekend. She was very insistent she see him. Izzy's gone to a lot of trouble organised most delicious meals, consommes and mousses and jellies, and she's gone to a lot of effort. And Alexander. He's not in a good, he's not in a good place himself. I received one of Isabella's long emails in which she was talking about a weekend when she had invited me um, to go and stay and that Lee was staying there. And she said how disappointing the weekend had been because basically he was just taking a lot of stuff in his bedroom the whole time and that she barely talked to him. That's very sad for Izzy. I think she wants him to show her some love and tell her how much he loves her, admires her, and make her laugh, as he did in the old days. And Alexander, understandably, is, is, is quite shocked by Izzy, and it frightens him. I think there were lots of complex things going on. Perhaps he knew he'd not been in good enough shape to be the support that she needed, but I think both of them needed support. Two weeks later, Isabella went to London for a photo shoot. On her way back to Gloucestershire, she stopped at a farm shop and bought poison. She didn't want to be a joke. And fashion is about judging looks, size, beauty, clothes, and she was looking at her future and all she was seeing was this kind of, you know, older, sad caricature of, of the glory days. She didn't want to be stuck somewhere between kitchen and oblivion. turned around and there was a person all dressed up very smartly in, in Highland costume. Then I realised it was Alexander. He looked utterly devastated. I felt very sorry for him. We just looked at each other. You know, the person we loved had gone. Five months after Isabella's death, McQueen and her other great discovery, Philip Tracy, staged a fashion show in Paris in her honour. They called it La Dame Bleu.
He always regarded her maybe as his most important critic or sounding board. The atmosphere was extraordinary. It sort of transcended being a fashion show, and everybody was touched. A muse is somebody who is a constant source of inspiration through their personality and through some sort of charisma. I asked her, do you feel let down by fashion? Do you think that contributed to your depression? And she said, no, fashion gave me everything. You can't buy a muse. It's like a love affair with somebody. By 2009, the ambition to make Alexander McQueen a global brand was a reality. It opened shops in Mayfair, Milan, LA and Vegas. He sold clothes online. He designed suitcases for a luggage line and a collection for one of the biggest discount chains in America. Life was a bit of a surprise for him that it had gone so well in a sense that he got to do everything he wanted. It's a bit like being a movie star in the 1930s Hollywood, that you live in this cocoon where they give you this whole studio set to play with, and he had that. McQueen's shop in London was just around the corner from the tailors where he started. If you can imagine, he's come from nothing to, to have all that wealth. But at the same time, it must, have been, it must have been under such a lot of pressure from the different people around him to produce new clothes, new collections, all the time. The pressure was never greater than on his shows. They now had a following worldwide. His October 2009 collection was to be streamed live on the internet. In the minutes before the show began, the site got so many hits, it collapsed. The arena itself, what emerged, silenced the audience. Your know, fashion is just closed, 99% of the time. But sometimes it does become a very fine art. The critics were entranced that night. They said McQueen had never been better. Actually, to see the thing alive, where the thing is beautiful, and they're in front of you, like when you laugh, people's eyes were kind of shining. He'd been there all the way through everything that happened to him. All the sort of successes and all the things that were not successes. She'd never judged him in terms of who he was. Four months after McQueen's triumph in Paris and three years after Isabella's suicide, McQueen's mother, Joyce, died of cancer. She was at every show. She was the first one on the list with me, brother. Always got to get his mum there. Always send her a bag or coat or scarf. Always thought the world of me mum. McQueen was living alone in Mayfair. In the week that followed, he retreated to his flat. There was a launch in New York in 10 days' time. The month after that was another show and another collection. The expectations were higher than ever. 
The strain of his loss and the relentless pressure of work was emerging in entries on his Twitter page. On the eve of his mother's funeral, he took a mix of cocaine and sleeping pills. Then he wrote a note in a book of drawings. Please look after my dogs. Sorry, I love you. Then he hanged himself in his wardrobe. It was announced on television news. I saw it there. And I was really horrified. I was stunned. Still am surprised. When I learned his death, I was immediately fondu in larmes. J'ai aussi été très choqué par la violence du geste parce qu'il y a mille et une façons de, de se donner la mort et il a choisi une, une manière très violente, très théâtrale, euh, sans doute à son image d'ailleurs. I think that Alexander's death would have infuriated Izzy, Izzy would be shouting at him. I said, why did you do this? You had everything to live for, Alexander. Anything the dress code, like, should you wear black to a wedding? You know, especially in the season when beige was the big color. So, there are a lot of people checking out what you're wearing. But it was nice that we all remembered him. So remember, we got the tickets and they had little white stickers on, and we were like, oh, here we go, fashion show time. But we were actually sat behind his family. And to the left of us was all the sort of what I'd call the upper echelon, you know, Kate Moss, Naomi. And obviously he knew them, but I like the fact that we did have lots of old friends from that time, from years ago. Great and fitting tribute to the brother. Bjork singing, gospel choir singing. It was, uh, it was fantastic. Then to top it all was the Pipers, who come walking from the back and leading us all out onto the steps where there was about 10 pipers. Yeah. Your mum would have loved her. She'd have been over the moon with that. She wouldn't have been over the moon with her brother. What he done? I'm afraid no one was. Uh, it's very um, disappointing in that respect. No, it was fantastic. So, his name lives on, they say. <laughs>